Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I promise Ken I'd meet my 12 minute limit, so I'm going to go very fast. If you can do that, if you can just read the first word in 12 minutes. <laughs> right, so, so, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about sustained immigration, uh, the intersection between sustainability, field information modeling, and integration. Where is it now? Where does it need to go? Um, I'm a PhD student at Stanford University um, at, at Psyche Lake Martin, and um, my research is funded through the Precord Energy Efficiency Center, ASHRAE, and uh, Psyche as well. So what are you going to hear about today? Um, I wasn't quite sure what the audience would, would be like at the symposium, um, so I, I, I basically decided to start things off by kind of giving, giving an overview of what kind of efforts are currently ongoing in industry in this world of building information modeling and sustainability and energy performance. Um, give you my, put my personal opinion of kind of really where things are. You know, let's, let's, let's get past the hype and, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the crap that people um, have difficulty sifting through one at a time. Um, kind of see where, where, where things are, are, are at the ground level. Uh, then share with you one new um, kind of vision or methodology um, that I'm looking at for my, in my research on how to um, advance simulation for sustainability uh, using building information modeling. And finally, some final thoughts on, on where we go from there. So um, one thing I want to start with, over the past nine months, I've been involved in a project called the o, uh, OGC AEC OO testbed. OGC being the Open Geospatial Consortium. Uh, which is an industry-sponsored organization that in the past has been involved in developing Canada's standards for the GIS world. A couple years ago, they decided to dip their toes into the building industry. Uh, for obvious reasons, they envision a world where you can zoom in in Google Earth, you know, and pull all this information out of a building and do rapid prototyping for different scenarios for emergency response, things of that nature. Um, that desire manifested itself in a test bed over the past nine months where the goal was to look at how we could advance interoperability in three particular areas, communications, project delivery, and decision support, or CPD, and they call these different three, these three different areas threads, uh, quantity takeoff for cost estimating, and building performance and energy analysis. And I managed the BPEA thread during this time. Um, the larger goal was really just to figure out how to get uh, faster, better, cheaper information exchange and collaborative work um, with a focus on integrated project delivery and lean construction. Um, so you can see the type of, I don't know if you can read this, um, a lot of organizations were involved, from, from the sponsors, the people that pointed out the money to do this, um, to the software developers that were involved, to consultants and other participants. So they're a very diverse group of people, which made for an interesting, uh, um, a very interesting melting pot uh, to try to deal with uh, and working through some of the issues we were, we were trying to address. And at the beginning of this, the goal was to find what would be the best possible solution for interoperability period. Because of the people we had involved, it kind of turned into uh, an exercise in how well does it, do IFCs work um, in the world of building information modeling. Um, IFC is standing for Industry Foundation Classes. For those of you not familiar with that, that's a data model that was developed by some people in the IAI, um, uh, International Alliance for Interoperability, um, that you hear a lot of people talking about in the BIM world as being a solution for exchanging uh, information between uh, different um, CAD and analysis app applications. Um, so the goal for the, for the BPA thread was to develop a set of functional user requirements um, for early design energy simulation uh, in the form of information delivery manual, IDM. These are all acronyms uh, that are part of the um, IAI and, and Business Smart International world. Um, and then create, uh, have those requirements manifest themselves in a, in a software developer facing document called a model B definition, or MVD. Um, parts of that MVD then were meant to be tested uh, during technology integration experiments in this process here, which was going to take, uh, or which, which it did take, um, basically a, a test model, uh, um, export that text, uh, test model um, to an IFC file and communicate. Um, status and um, 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 basically uh, the manage the, the data communication with different parties in a CPD tool, but in the project wise, I'm not familiar with that. Um, use a model checker to check the integrity of the model. How well did this IFC file meet the model view definition requirements? Um, and then we passed it through to a series of middleware, which is really the heart of the work. 
um, which was headed up by Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, which was which is essentially a set of tools. GST stands for Geometry Simplification Tool. And what it does, it, it, it takes an, it would take the IFC model, or the building model in this uh, model in this data model, uh, convert it from the architectural view to the thermal view, so the series of data transformations um, that would occur. And then IDF generator here would take that information in ASCII format and create an input file for Energy Plus, which is a, an energy simulation engine um, um, originally funded by the Department of Energy. Uh, you can imagine here that the value of this process is that at the end of the day, this is what we're trying to get to is a semi-automated process to get a 3D model from a BIM application into an energy simulation tool. Uh, to take some of the uncertainty out that people experience now and just leave it up to the, that a particular user to figure out how do I transform this model into something that will fit into this application downstream. Uh, you can imagine here, IDF stands for uh, uh, is, is the input file for Energy Plus. This could be uh, IES generator, this could be Ecotech generator, this could be DO2 generator, this could be any kind of generator you want for any type of performance analysis you want downstream. All those applications require some sort of data transformation to take place before you can take something the architect does up here and get into something this engine likes down there. Um, at the core of this work um, is the concept of space boundaries. Um, you can imagine um, uh, if I'm standing in this room and say the architect draws the walls and a cat tool for this room and the ceiling and the floor. Um, as I look at from the perspective of inside this room, I see boundaries on the inner surface of this wall. Right? Those, those are referred to as first level space boundaries. All right? Energy Plus doesn't know what to do with those, doesn't care about those. Okay, what Energy Plus cares about is what's on the other side of that wall. So, if I just, an example here, an architect would draw a wall here. We'd have a, a first level space boundary here, a first level here, and a first level here. Okay? What Energy Plus wants to see is what fraction of that wall sees this space for conduction, what fraction of the wall sees this space for conduction. Um, and this little guy right here um, sees conduction from this space to this construction. And you can't model that unless you have 2D or 3D heat transfer, which no, no simulations tool, uh, tools do right now. Uh, so these are referred to as second level. This is referred to as a third level space boundary. Uh, and this is really the greatest barrier to realize in the whole DM to thermal simulation paradigm. Is how do you get the architectural view of a model to a thermal view? How do you, how do, you do that? that reduction, that simplification um, from the actual model to the analytical model. Uh, you know, and questions we, we dealt with, well, who should do it? Right, let's, say you, let's say you know how to do it. Should it be the BIM authoring vendor? Should it be a middleware vendor? Should it be a downstream analysis vendor? You know, is, is the onus on, uh, in, this, in our particular process here, it just so happen that LVNL has been working with Graphisoft on uh, enabling the export of these type of boundaries in their IFC utility. Okay? But, now, when other vendors like Autodesk and Nemechek and Bentley think about, you know, do I want to enable this functionality for my users, um, th there's differing opinions, uh, certainly. Um, and there's no really right answer, I don't believe. At the end of the day, the user doesn't care where this happens, as long as it happens in the same way each time for the same model. Right. Um, so what we we're doing as part of the OGC work and part of the partially funded by the GSA was um, to work with LBNL, Digital Alchemy, AC3, and Grunland to develop a set of test cases, implementation guidelines that says if you have this series of spatial configurations, atrium here, skylight here, what have you, here's where you need to put those boundaries. Uh, this is data model neutral. It doesn't matter if it's GBXML, IFC, whatever exchange format you want to use to exchange information between tools, this should hold. All right. The particular schema what we're using was IFC, so there's little snippets of what the IFC files should actually look like. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, this should serve for, um, for any data model. Uh, what is the GSA doing? I've been involved with the GS, uh, General Services Administration. Um, for those of you that don't know, the largest landlord in the country. They, they design all the federal buildings, courthouses, and board stations in the country. Um, and uh, I've been a part of the BIM program for the past several years, and the GSA has gotten very interested in how we can leverage the power of BIM for sustainable design. So we've done a series of pilot projects. I'm looking at energy analysis into Ryusuka, uh, energy installation daylight in IES, installation Ecotag, Equest, Greenbelt Studio. Like I mentioned, the space boundary work. Uh, 
just last month we published our first version, uh, public version of the GSA Vingado 5 on energy performance, which starts to establish, starts to think about what kind of re requirements um, the GSA would want to have in the world of thermal uh, performance uh, for BIM model. Um, and the GSA BIM View 2009 is basically going to be when GSA goes to the software vendors later this year, like they did several years ago in 2006 for the spatial validation requirements, um, and says, we have some updated requirements for spatial validation, which is the O2 guide, energy performance for the O5 guide, and circulation and security analysis for the O6 guide. Um, some other kind of studies the GSA is doing is kind of a survey of, of sustainable design tools, current functionality, what works, what doesn't. At the end of the day, the GSA, uh, um, you know, the official statement is they're vendor neutral, and all other things being held equal, they are. But if someone sends me an email so that I have a Revit model, and I can choose between IES or Ecotech, what works, what doesn't, uh, we have to make a recommendation. They need to figure out what, what to do next. And so uh, these, these kind of surveys help us figure out what, what the current status is. So kind of where are things now, really, um, in this whole BIM to thermal simulation paradigm? Well, um, you know, it's a hot topic, demand's growing, um, and markets are starting to respond. But there's still a communication disconnect between the users and the software vendors. Um, it's still really a chicken or the egg dilemma. The, the, the development resources are not being committed by the vast majority of the software vendors because what I hear from them is they, they're, not, they're not seeing the demand as a part of the user base. And there's, there could be many reasons why they don't see that. Um, um, mainly because you know, we all think here the demand's obvious, but um, people just aren't voicing that you know, stating clearly what their user requirements should be. Um, and because of that, um, it's hard to get traction with vendors. At the same time, the users are waiting for the technology to come to them uh, so they can see what this can do for them and the value added. Right? There's the chicken in the egg. Um, current building performance engines like Energy Plus, Do2, um, and Apple graphical user interfaces like eQuest, IES, Remote Studio, Ecotech, Hipacom, they, they really don't do what we need them to do as of today. Um, a lot of them are going in the right direction, but, but the fact remains that, that they're not quite there. Um, the value of BIM based thermal simulation is highly case specific. Frequently, it doesn't pay off. That's the reality. You know, I'd love to say it's, it's, you know, it's there, let's use it, but depending upon the complexity of your model, what phase you're in, <coughs> the geometry of the building, uh, what you want to try to do with this, sometimes it's just better doing things the old fashioned way. And unfortunately, um, the conclusion I've come to um, what we're dealing with this for, for so long now is that uh, really designers should maintain two models. Your actual model and your analytical model, your analytical representation of the model. Basically a dumbed down version of the model that, that has a little bit of forethought into it, thinking downstream to what the applications are you want to use. Um, and you know, I, I see this with a lot of large design firms. I know IES, when they do consulting, they tell all their clients um, you know, keep two models uh, because to take a detailed model, especially once you, get, once you get beyond concept design and try to get that information into a building performance application downstream um, is, is uh, really just not quite there yet. I see I ran out of time, so I'll go a lot faster. Um, ISCs, GBXMLs. People talk about IFCs all the time. It's really been like this 20-car train that's never quite gotten going. Um, the only options are the tools IEF uh, or Ryuska, which is, which is very limited what it can do, an IEF generator, which is not publicly available. People argue, you know, should we stick with Express, we should go to XML. Um, really, the, where, where the industry needs to go is to web services architecture. XML is obviously more conducive to that. I personally believe that, that the data model of the future is going to be an XML. Um, but th this is one of the discussions still ongoing right now. Uh, IFC development right now is in the hands of a few. Must be brought out into a broader community. It's bottleneck right now, and it's just not working. Um, and finally, there's not uh, there's, there's a lack of adequate implementation standards and testing validation protocols, um, and really, the data model needs to be restructured uh, when, when you really look at it. GBXML, more people use it. It applies to a lot of different, you know, uh, a lot of different analysis tools that are compatible with it, um, but it suffers from the lack of the same lack of implementation standards um, that IFC does. Right, you can show the schema to everyone, but what do you do when you have an offset light well with a, a skylight like that? Right? I know people at Bentley heard about the energy XML export do it in a different way. 
then say Autodesk doesn't know. But there's no right way stated, documented anywhere to, to give guidance on how to address those issues. Um, Quick question. Yeah. I mean, Grant, is there anything that you can share with us in that regard um, with respect to what might be going on in the GBXML world at this time? Um, I couldn't right now. I might be able to reach someone and find out. Okay. Yeah. okay. I don't know. Those guys are all on East Coast time, so I might not be able to do so. And I know one thing that's, that's being done right now to try to improve that, well, this is actually the brainchild of John Kennedy, um, is an ASHRAE project to basically define what are the data transformation requirements and, and data reductions, or what is that formal logic that you need to do um, to convert architectural model to a thermal model. And what that does is once you establish that, that'll tell you stuff like, okay, if I want to you know, export a GBX small file on the vendor. Um, here's how I deal with that white well. Here's how I deal with that overlap of that wall and that atrium. You know, here, here's, here's how I deal with that. Um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has a project, um, GBX Mill Development for Energy Pro, Bentley Architecture, Integration of Cubicom, uh, Reverend McKee's uh, going to have uh, Carmel software, um, HVAC design software integrated to Reverend MVP soon. Um, and the, the SketchUp plugin for, or the Energy Plus plugin for SketchUp is getting uh, better and better. So um, I'll get to Grant now. Um, just a brief overview of what, what we're looking at in my research is basically um, can we create a multidisciplinary optimization method um, where you can plug in commonly used CAD tools and hook it up to something up here, a, CAD, a, a building information model, a parametric design tool. Um, so we're working with Geary Technologies um, to basically create a process here where we can set up a parametric model of digital project which is based off of CATIA and transfer that information via IFC to Radiance, Energy Plus, and Fluent. The very interesting thing about mechanical design um, that you don't find in any other discipline in ADC is that to fully define the thermal performance of a building you need three types of analysis. You need an energy simulation, a daylight simulation, and a CFD simulation. Okay. Um, any, the, any lack of one of those three, you get an incomplete picture of what's going on in the building. We never see this as structural design. Did you see someone do an analysis on beams and columns and someone else do section sizing? Separate, not talk to each other. No. Why? Because it all works as an integrated system. And you don't understand how one system works until you look at the other. Same for thermal design, but no one does this. Typically, this is, this is three different tools done by three different people three different firms. Um, and information is not exchanged across these three. So what we're looking at is a system where we're, we're actually going to be running a daylight simulation on radiance, um, and, and we're working with, with the distributed computing where we can take the building and identify which zones we have to do daylight in, split it apart, send it to several processors, um, bring it back, get an annual performance metric for the building as a whole, shoot it down to Energy Plus um, using the daylight performance of that design, get surface temperatures, airflow data, use the fluid and boundary conditions, break up the building um, in, in, in a similar way as we do for daylighting. Then use optimization algorithms like um, you know, um, genetic algorithms or gradient optimizer, whatever might work for that discipline. Right, I'll, I'll be done to this. Um, <laughs> and you basically have this close, and, and this decides then what, based on the results of these three analyses, what's the next design? And it goes and tells the parametric model what to change to. And you have this closed loop. And it's basically a constraint-based analysis where you have design parameters, you have ranges for those parameters, you know, I want to vary line to orientation, here are my ranges, what are your performance constraints? I want to make, I want to meet uh, lead platinum requirements. I want to be 60% below ASH rate, 90.1. Um, but my daylight needs to be here, my cost needs to be here. Um, what kind of environment are we doing this in? Uh, we're looking at executing these large trace studies environment called um, Model Center, which is a PIDO software, Process Integration Design Optimization, that's been used a lot in the aerospace industry, which Grant will talk about in a second. Um, this is the, the framework within which we plan to execute this process right here. Um, early results have been very promising. Um, here you can see kind of the results of a design of experiments where we had 1800 simulations to kind of define the very narrow design space we defined, where we can you know, look how orientation of lengths vary. Uh, or impact life, total life cycle costs, and then we used a, um, a hybrid optimizer that Boeing developed to basically get to the same solutions based on the constraints in, in much shorter time. Here's an example of what we did on MDO that we did between structural performance using a program called GSA that Eric uses for structural performance. 
and energy plus. And here you can see the kind of data you can get out of here. You can start to identify point designs um, um, that that um, reflect different stakeholder goals and preferences. So here you can see a Pareto front um, showing the trade-off between first cost and operating costs. And you can you can scroll over these points and you see the geome geometric design. So where do we go from here? Um, users need to speak louder um, as to what the requirements are. Uh, they need to be formalized and explicitly made before it's going to get traction uh, with vendors. Uh, we need to develop and implement rigorous consensus-based standards for BIM and interoperability in the U.S. and around these user requirements, the emphasis here being in the U.S., Building Smart International, the problem is we have the same, uh, the, the U.S. best interests in mind. And so Building Smart Alliance really needs to take the lead in this. Um, software vendors, um, you know, need to understand that a critical mass has been reached, so a competitive advantage does indeed lie with first adopters um, in this arena. And if you have one and two in place, it reduces the risk for the vendors, and, and the, the numbers will speak for themselves. Uh, the, the one and two were the biggest complaints we had from the, from, from the vendors participating in the testbed. We don't have the user requirements. We don't have this to give us any certainty that if we spend development resources to, to meet this specification, it's not going to change two years from now. Um, we need to align common visions and alleviate the piece of the pie syndrome. Um, there's a lot of funding now in government agencies, Department of Energy, GSA, NIST, uh, and people are spending the money on the same thing, and they're going in different directions. It's, it's going to be a waste, and we're going to end up three years from now really regretting it. Um, I, I personally don't think that, that Marcus alone will, will do this quick enough, that the federal government could most effectively go to the cast through focused executive mandates, um, like stricter energy codes and interagency coordination. Um, focusing that stimulus funding on tax incentives to create the right price signals for the market. Uh, I think that's the jump start that uh, the, the, the private industry needs. Um, like I said, we're going to move towards web services and parallel distributed computing. And um, you know, as a PhD student, I couldn't end without making a plug for you know, if you, if you train people on, on, on where uh, on how to think about design when, once they get started, they're going to come out to the workforce and they're going to demand. Uh, a certain workflow and software to support that. And that's the bottom up. Um, number four is top down. You need somewhere in the middle. Well, one of the things that occurs to me, and, and one of the challenges that we faced, is that we don't design in BIN currently. That might change with Revit 2010, which has a, a, a better conceptual model, if you understand. But a lot of the design work takes place in SketchUp or something like that. And really, one of the questions that we're asking ourselves is, does our design process, how should our design process change? And ultimately, I agree, we have to have two models. That's what we're saying. That's what we have to do right now. I actually believe we need to start with the analysis model. Though. We need to start with the simple models to get the information back early that actually guides the architecture. We're backwards because, I don't know if you said it or Martin said it, it begins with an image. And, and the owner wants to spend the least possible money to get the image to go out and put, to get money going. But once that image is out there, that's set in people's mind, and that's what we're designing to. Mm -hmm. So part of it is, is that our community has to completely change our own process to incorporate sustainable design thinking into it. And, and, and then that gets at you know, one of these practicality gaps, which is this difficulty right now. Of if we do put it in the bin, well, we've already made all the decisions, so it's too late anyway. Right. And then we've got this, tran <laughs> this translation issue of trying to get it into GBXML, which we're just, we're just doing it backwards. It's almost like we just need a modeler to model the GBXML directly. Mm -hmm. you know, forget about translating it. Let's just start there, and then we go into the bin. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it comes down to kind of level of granularity you want you know, design to an early design. And, you know, a lot of people use, I mean, I don't know a whole lot of people that use the same tools that are in very early design that they use later on, right? You people use SketchUp, you can Rhino, right? They're playing with different, uh, easier to use tools um, to try to figure out where, where to start, what's even want to more detailed, right? Um, and so one of the one of the benefits of um, it, the process we were, we were looking at here is we with the parametric model, but that, that's new enough for most architects in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. We aren't used to thinking 
in the world of parametric training. They want to sit down, they want to take a wall tool, they want to draw a wall, they want to connect it up. They're not used to sitting there specifying that kind of relationship that I relate to everything. So, and then that's one thing that we're, we're kind of struggling how to work around with, with our process. But um, yeah, I completely agree that you need to have one you want to have real granularity on par with an analytical model to start. And one of, one of the things that happens in, in the aerospace industry, which I'll talk about a little bit, is conceptual and preliminary design are much more clearly defined, mm -hmm. it seems to me, than in the AEC industry. But that has its own problems. You create silos, and they don't talk to one another. Mm -hmm. and so how can right. we get them exchanging information so that process is easier? Because what will happen is, they'll send the parameters down in preliminary design, and they'll go and actually do some detailed analysis, and if it doesn't work, that's the message that gets sent back. It doesn't work. Give me something else. Mm -hmm. And it's right. very inefficient. Mm -hmm. So you've got to, if you want to start going there, you've got to think about the communication between potentially different groups. Yeah. yeah. Is it mentioned this may be a really um, misguided question. Sure. What are the inputs to your optimizer algorithm? So the I mean that, that at the high level, level, real high level. I'm not talking specifics here. Okay. So um, I mean what, what the optimizer is, and you can feel free to jump on the app. The optimizer is basically going to look at what are the results of each of the analyses and what are the constraints on okay. the, the objective. This, that. this, that's all I need to know. Yeah. Okay. Because the real question is, you're doing thermal design, right? Mm -hmm. When do you go back to the actual building that gets built and measure how much energy it's consuming and put that back into the model? Where does that happen? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question. <laughs> that's that's uh, um, that's, that's, that's hard. That's right, right. So that, that, that's, that's why there should be that's why there should be a requirement on I mean, any lease certification that you get provisional status once yep. the building's open right. and you have metering and monitoring for two years. But you, as the designer, you're not responsible for that. Is what you're saying? Right? As of now, contractually, the designer is not responsible for that. Right. A lot well, of people think that that should be part of it. And that's thank you. I have no more questions. Have a performance contract. <laughs> <laughs> that. That's just a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a great point. There's a huge disconnect between how yeah. the building's actually because I was really excited when I saw you know, inputs your op into your into your validation, right? You, like, yeah, I saw you say the words validation were up there. I thought, oh man, you're going to do it. <laughs> well, that's a whole different. It's a whole different type of validation. I know. Uh, well, it's very important. We're talking, talking fact-based rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're making good progress, and we've got.